so sumptuous food and long queues are disaster for the next upcoming session so i think we have got both the combinations the food is yummy and the lines the queue is long but nevertheless uh, what's missing in quantity will be made up with quality work okay so we have got our chair person conveners of the session my pleasure to introduce dr gautam zaveri and uh, dr abhilash tanwe dhruv and also the chair persons for the session dr nikhil joshi and dr kapil mohan welcome all and without further ado i'll request the chair person to take over the proceedings inviting the first speaker to the podium all right good afternoon everybody welcome to wirock post lunch session uh, let's start with our session today uh, may i call upon uh, first speaker of the day mr satyan uh, dr satyan mehta uh, his talk is quadriparesis after cervical decompression good afternoon everyone thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, so so this is a interactive case discussion on uh, uh, post operative uh, deficit Uh, this uh, 70 year old male came with uh, uh, this 70 year old male came with uh, bilateral upper limb and lower limb weakness uh, he had spasticity uh, quadriparesis he was still walking but he had grade 4 4 plus power uh, no bladder bowel deficits he had uh, he was a hypertensive and uh, some history of ischemic heart disease but no procedure was done uh, and uh, this is what his uh, mri shows Uh, so i'd like to involve the uh, faculty at this stage itself uh, dr zavari i will not involve you because you know about this case already uh, dr badani sir uh, at this stage what uh, are you thinking of uh, i have limited uh, pictures uh, so this patient has a opll or seen on the x ray as well uh, there is no frank instability but uh, there is a definite opll element here so he needs a uh is a quadriparetic right yes so he'll need decompression along with uh, stabilization at uh, these two levels so decompression at 4 uh, 5 and 5 6 yeah posterior and uh, stabilization at those two levels yes only. yes uh, and uh, anything about the prognosis that you would like to tell this patient in this is there is it uh, different from any other patient as to how you counsel them yeah there is a greater chance of uh, post operative neurological deficit due to the type of disorder that he is suffering from and uh, also again recovery you cannot guarantee like in any other uh, conditions uh, cord compressions uh, dr nikhil uh, any other comments uh, is uh, fusion the way to go here Uh, generally in uh, fusion i usually keep it for the uh, young or middle age patients considering that he is already have a ischemic heart disease history and medically uh, not very fit hmm. i would consider decompression as a first part but as a rule in every cervical myelopathy patient i am doing posteriorly i usually get a ct scan and a flexion extension x ray is done and if it, there is any evidence of instability on those x rays i would fix it otherwise i tend to do only decompression which is a quick in quick out job and at the same time that will minimize the amount of anesthesia as well regards to counseling part i usually tell my patients that this is a preventive surgery and this is for prevention of further deficit whatever That's deficit right. you already have may or may not improve at the same time there is a risk that because of the sudden decompression of the cord which has been compressed for long time it is possible that it may increase and that may be because of the cord edema so i'll go ahead to the to what was done uh, we did a decompression and a stabilization of this patient uh, since he had a opll from high level i've done from a c3 to c6 uh, laminectomy and lateral mass screws were pl play, uh, were put in uh, as a rule i uh, at o every opll case we put i do do a fusion to get a better uh, lordosis and to uh, prevent uh, post operative kyphosis as well uh this patient uh, the surgery went quite uneventfully and he woke up uh, with a normal uh, neurology uh, which was equal to what he was uh, pre operative but as the day progressed i started getting calls uh, from the rmo that uh, you know he started complaining of some weakness in the legs uh, which i thought ke maybe it is not uh, such a, a big deal maybe he is not uh, checking it very well maybe he is a little drowsy 
and by evening that uh, call became that he is not moving his legs at all and uh, so progressively he start, started getting weakness and now uh, from uh, being normal he has now progressed to becoming grade zero power uh, by evening time so this is around eight o'clock or so that this has happened uh, what would you do next abhilash uh, what uh, anything that you would uh, what is the going on in your head yeah head right so now. first things first um uh, a slowly deteriorating deficit after the patient wakes up with a normal preoperative neurological status is definitely a red flag you are not going to just wait and do nothing first things first you will want to investigate this i'll order an mri at the same time the first thing which is going to strike me is because there's a history of a clopidogrel there's a very high chance that this could be a post operative hematoma which is compressing the cord secondarily so definitely document that and go ahead and open it if it shows a hematoma uh, dr badani patient has uh, already has a drain put in place uh, and the drain is also functioning so do you still think that this could be a post operative hematoma yeah yeah even in presence of drain you can get uh, compressive hematomas because the drain may not be draining everything it might be blocked might be draining part of it there could be clot formation anything else that is in your mind any other differential diagnosis what else could cause it uh, it is slowly progressive so any ischemic things are likely but possible but not likely because doctor zavari anything to add here sir any anything else other than a hematoma uh, that could explain this well you could get a, not only hematoma it could be a cord edema you can get a, pers a ascending cord edema post operatively which could have happened because of manipulation of the spinal cord uh, during the surgery and that can also cause this i think the first two three steps which you should take is that you should immediately check that your yeah, that your blood pressure is maintained and you should try to keep the mean arterial pressure about 90 100 in this patient this in, or, in order to keep this thing no no post op also once you have developed this this realize that there is a neurologic deficit the second thing that you must do is maintain his oxygenation also for the cord third is that if you are a believer then you should be giving solumedrol to reduce the cord edema fourth is check the drain whether it is working adequately or not if not you know obviously and the fifth thing is as abila said that you must do an mri scan in order immediately in order to see what is the cause if the patient has woken up from the surgery post the surgery with neurology then you are thinking more of in terms of cord manipulation or cord injury because of this thing here it is a weakness which was not there and it is now developing cord edema is certainly one but one of the most common causes as you all all mentioned is a hematoma and that is something which we should be looking into displaced hardware if it was there if you have put a fixation would have presented immediately Easy. post op it is again not something which you would present after some time so yes your first diagnosis here would be a hematoma and you need to actually look at it uh, on an mri scan so i'll go to the mri <laughs> this is uh, what the mri showed this is what his uh, immediate post op mri shows the drain which was present inside is still functioning but still this is what uh, is present uh, your thoughts did you use gel foam in this yeah so basically at uh, this is what i don't use anymore but at that time we used to use a very thin layer of gel foam on the dura and this is what uh, is a gel foam which has basically swollen up and started and given the cord compression so yes. so there are plenty of lit reports in literature which show that you know gel foam when you use it sometimes not all the time but sometimes the it admixes with the clot and swells up and can cause cord compression like this i have had one patient in the dorsal spine who has had then i re-explored and uh, removed everything and she recovered neurologically so anyway now here you can see there is very significant compression the question is is there any role for conservatism or not in this patient so let's ask dr badani what dr badani what no. what do you, how would should you proceed now that you have seen this mri scan no the, he would require uh, evacuation of the hematoma how early he was on clopidogrel so the, with this your scenario already the patient has landed up with a hematoma are you going to go immediately will you wait for some time for a day or so to see whether the 
we just give steroids and see whether the patient is improving, what would be your approach? See, there is significant amount of compression and uh, at the most you could use uh, tranexamic acid and uh, vitamin K and all that. Prime, prime up with those drugs <coughs> and go as early as possible because the longer it remains compressed, it's going to be you know, difficult in recovering. Abhilash, what would you do? So my threshold for exploring this is very low. I would definitely, once I have uh, documented that there is severe compression of the cord, I would go in and definitely evacuate the hematoma. This time maybe put two wide bore drains to hopefully prevent this from happening again. Of course, along with water measures you already mentioned. Right. So, Nikhil, you go in there, you'll see that there is this gel foam mass and all. You'll obviously remove it in this thing. But before you go in there, what are you going to tell the patient's relative? Now, this Complete. patient has gone from grade five, 4 to grade 0 and you are going in to evacuate the hematoma. How, what are you going, how do you go counsel the relative in terms of uh, improvement in neurology, in terms of what you are going to do, why this has happened, what are you going to tell the doctor? So, first thing is to clear, uh, clearly mention to them the clinical status of the patient and uh, they obviously know that he is, he is not moving and uh, tell them that we have done the diag uh, diagnosis on MRI that there is a compression which needs to be removed. At the same time, uh, we, in terms of improvement, it will be a gradual, it will be assisted with uh, long, uh, maybe three or four days of steroid therapy afterwards. But really, we cannot guarantee and it has to be assessed on day-to-day -day basis after surgery. But considering that we have got the diagnosis, there is a compressive element, there is a fairly good chance that he will improve. And it has to be a sympathetic approach to the patient. Relatives. So, I'd like to add here <clears throat> that for this patient, I had uh, counseled them. I've been very, very open and direct about what was going on. And I explained to them uh, that we need to do it immediately. We need to get all the blood clot out and whatever is compressing out. And then wait and watch and see how much he improves. <clears throat> and uh, uh, after the, should I just go ahead? Uh, so, even after that, I have done a decompression. I have uh, I've gone in and I have uh, removed everything off. And... Uh, uh, he started getting improvement immediately. As soon as he woke up, he started getting improvement by morning. He was grade 2 plus power. And then physiotherapy was gone on uh, at home as well. And uh, he uh, continued to improve, but he never regained the full uh, power which he came with preoperatively. He was grade 3 plus or so, but he was walking with the help of a walker, but never regained that. For this patient, uh, if I may add. So then, uh you know that if you see the C7 lamina, the upper end of the C7 lamina seems to slightly be digging into the uh, yes. spinal cord. Is this something you think may be a, in, a deterrent to complete recovery? Yeah, I, uh, it's not uh, that bad on the axial views. Actually, there is a little bit of an artifact here so because of the screw and the rod. So that's why it appears that way. But it was quite clear and on, on table it was very open. So it was not an issue. For this patient, I, you know, you, you got to keep your complications very close to you. So I was very, very open. I used to go and see, I have even gone to their house and seen him, you know, on a monthly basis on my Sunday mornings and kept on explaining, etc. They were reasonably good. In spite of that, there was, uh, you know, they still consulted some other uh, spine surgeons and they were told that, oh, after that, ho gaya, like, handling may have happened and it, you can, it can happen. And then, you know, they came back with, they said, Kuch hua kya, did something happened during surgery, etc. So those doubts still kind of remained in their head. But, uh, you know, you can do what you can do. So they, did, of course, did not cause any problems. They still remain good patients and they sent other patients as well. But this is the issue. Uh, uh, Dr. Srivastav, sir, what, what do you take care in counselling in these patients? And how would you manage in counselling terms, free from yeah. beginning till the end? Yeah, actually, uh, best is to start this from the beginning before surgery. Yes. If you have an index case where there is a significant compression, like cervical myelopathy, I would say specifically, you tell that, see, I have seen patient who has come walking, though they have deficit, but they are able to uh, manage to walk, but they can become grade zero also. Mm -hmm. So this is a possibility, though it is a remote, and same time we are not scaring also. Say it is like a walking on the road, but now walking on the jumpy road. So that is the situation. And when suppose in case it happens, then in the, it, is, it is better to inform on the same evening, just after the surgery, now uh, I find there is some problem. 
and he is not able to but we will try to you know uh, treat the way it is described definitely without any doubt and let's hope how he is going to improve gradually we will see and i think that clear in thing uh, information should be there yeah communication is very important don't avoid the relatives don't avoid the relatives only what happens sometime every time you will find a new relative so actually that you should do in the prior hand only in a risky case you choose one or two relatives who are closer to the patient or who stay with the patient people mm -hmm. who are staying with the patient i think you should have a good communication and that most of the time you don't have any problem when these patients and relative become your very good uh, i think uh, 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 you know very patient good, yes. category uh, dr badani sir uh, uh, before we end the last few points on what would you do to prevent post op deficit in a cervical myelopathy case what are the points that you are important so, to be kept i think that one of the things that i do I, I, when i use gel form i keep it outside the lamin i don't tuck it in mm -hmm. so it remains outside all the time it never goes in so probably that has due to that is and i have never had a problem with the gel form secondly i think you did whatever had to be done i mean you put a drain you did everything so this was an unfortunate event i think uh, beyond this i think there is nothing else that you have not done to ensure that you know patient should get good Yes, sir, Doctor Zaveri. Sorry. Any Steps points that uh, you will take to prevent a post-op deficit in cervical myelopathy? So I think steps are all along the way. Preoperatively, if the, I like to stop clopidogrel at least five days before the surgery, there is some literature to suggest that in general surgery and abdominal surgery they don't stop. But you must remember they are cavitary surgeries, whereas spine surgery is a closed cavity. and therefore a hematoma can be a problem in the second thing is in positioning the patient be careful not to put the patient in too much extension because before you start only the patient can get in increase impingement and problems third is that during the surgery maintain the oxygenation i don't allow the systolic to fall below 100 in patients with tight myelopathies fourth is obviously maintenance of oxygenation fifth is i always start steroids on these patients preoperatively so i give steroid overnight it goes on as a solumedrol or a methylprednisolone goes on in a 1 gram in 500 ml of normal saline starts overnight continues through the operative procedure and continues for 8 hours post operatively so that way you give a drip just to reduce the edema from the handling of the spinal cord the other thing that you can do is that you must use work only in the lateral gutter do not work in centrally sometimes we feel we did everything perfectly there was nothing but you are using big instruments even a carison one or two the foot plate is big enough in a tight canal to cause further compression so work in the lateral gutter if you can if you have access to things like a harmonic scalpel a high speed drill then you can bore the gutters make a whole channel and then lift up do what is called as an arm block laminectomy that reduces the risk significantly at the end meticulous hemostasis keep a drain so that this is there also you must remember that there is a huge trend especially among the younger spine surgeons to instrument spines especially following laminectomy etc and they give excuses such as opll and all that is all bullshit avoid instrumentation whenever unnecessary in the cervical spine the risk of hematoma is much higher the risk of some reason neurologic deficit is also higher chronic neck pain is higher and proximal junctional kyphosis is also higher in patients with a uh, posterior instrumentation anyway i think the lovely case there uh, satyan thank you very much so the the patient's cord expanded quite well after your surgery but unfortunately the patient did recover but not completely so and that is one of the problems but in his case to be fair with him he got into the patient within 24 hours the hematoma had not organized with hematomas it has been seen that the results are better when you go as soon as you detect the hematoma the earlier the better do not wait procrastinate at, as uh abila said you should have a short threshold for attacking it
So go in early and attack it because that's when the best results. Once the hematoma gets organized, then the and you know it's three or four days post the bleeding has started, then the chances of neurological recovery go down significantly. Thank you, Satin. We now move on to Dr. Ketan Badani, who's going to present another case. Please join us on the podium, Satin. I welcome Dr. Badani. His case is the foot drop following L45 decompression plus or minus fusion. Welcome, sir. The title is slightly incorrect, but anyway, it's similar. So, uh, complications teach us a lot of things. This was a 51 year old female patient who had a history of a two to three year history of bilateral leg claudications, gradually worsening, difficulty in walking. And when she presented to me, the, uh, she was already walking with support. There was a history of some lumbar spine surgeries done 20 years ago, around 1997 when I saw her. And uh, all were anterior surgeries and previous papers were not available. So I, I didn't know what surgeries and what for the surgeries were done. On clinical side, uh, uh, the lumbar movement SLR was normal, but she had a significant deficit as I have depicted here. Uh, it spared the quadriceps and the plantar flexors and was predominantly affecting the uh, L5 bilaterally symmetrical, like something like a conus lesion. <coughs> Although the planters were not there, but the lesion looked like a conus lesion. And these uh, were her MRI pictures. So as uh, you all can see, there is compression at uh, D11, 12, L12, L45, L5, S1. On the right hand side, you can see a fused spine uh, from L2, L3, L4 and adjacent segments are uh, having uh, uh, degenerative stenosis. Uh, Atyan, Dr. Srivastav, your comments? So, multiple level stenosis is there and uh, neurologically on clinical examination you have a little mixed picture. So, uh, and uh, any upper motor neuron signs? Uh, no. No. So, uh, in this scenario, Okay, now if the patient is having disabling uh, issues, and now she has deteriorated in this… Uh, deteriorated over two, three years. She has having years walk deteriorated. Yeah, deteriorated. Uh, and when, uh, I, she, when she came to me the first time, that time this deficit was already there. There. And what about uh, diabetes? Is she having component no, no, of peripheral neuropathy? No, 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 no. She, was, she was not having any of the medical conditions. Mm -hmm. no. Now, usually these patients now, in, who have gradually deteriorated since last one or two years, Usually, we have to warn them that there may not be full recovery because that is the one important thing. Because usually acute onset, acute, I would not say it, acute on chronic is difficult to, you know, comment. But relatively, fresher neurological deficit, which you uh, uh, having a matching situation in radiological investigation, usually they improve with the decompression. So, in this situation, where there is a radiological compression as well as there is a neurological deficit, I think we should give a chance. So, the surgical basically, uh, if I summarize the case, uh, there was a previous uh, lumbar spine surgeries, anterior surgery, all, the, all of the surgeries previous were anterior. Uh, we can call it a tandem stenosis because there is a, there's a cord and root compression, D11, 12 and the lumbar spine. There is adjacent segment disease. There is a neurological deficit where the uh, lower motor neuron seems to be masking the upper motor neuron lesion. So I, I don't think uh, every, uh, everybody agrees on this point, uh, what, the, what she needs surgery. Dr. Zavari? Yeah, yeah, we should go ahead with surgery, but we need flexion extension views here to see the evidence of instability at the proximal junction of that fusion and distal junction of that fusion. Yeah, uh, uh, some of those, my files had become corrupt, so I could not uh, present those, but uh, at L4-5 there was instability. Other levels were okay. All right, so, so yeah, uh, I, would because like we are discussing complications. Let's put the, uh, this thing, go further and say, ki, yes, surgery is required you would do a decompression at the proximal segment and at the distal segment and if the fix, if there is a problem of instability at the distal segment that is at L4-5, then I would fuse 4-5 also. 
So, uh, you have, Gautam, you have addressed this, but on the last question was that in this patient there is a loss of sagittal imbalance. Would that be any point of consideration at this uh, point? Because the patient has mainly come for leg symptoms and walking difficulties. So, leg, I mean, the sagittal imbalance is always a consideration, but I wouldn't do a special osteotomy or anything for this. I would just try to do L45 discectomy and an interbody fusion and whatever correction I can get from the interbody fusion by putting a cage, I would do that. Okay. Wouldn't do too much more. Okay. So, uh, I did uh, laminectomy at uh, D11-12, skipped the D12-L1 and uh, decompressed L12, L45, L5-S1 and uh, stabilization. L45 uh, with interbody and uh, screws. I did not uh, attempt to do any correction of the kyphosis or anything. So, I would like to know Dr. Uh, Abhilash, would, would you agree with what uh, has been done or you think that uh, you have done something different? Would, would Probably do the same. Would you, would you have considered going to S1? So, assuming that you're, you have a huge block of fused bone above, if I have to go to S1, then I'll be obligated to do an ilia fixation because a huge fusion mass sitting on top of my alpha yeah. S1. Yeah. And S1 screws will be notoriously weak. So definitely do a short I, segment now. I have excluded the uh, D12 L1. Is that a hindrance or should I have done it or should it's okay to leave it? Because there was no compression at D12 L1. The D11 12 showed the, the uh, cord compression. Yes. So she probably she came mainly for the lower motor neuron type of symptoms like claudication. So main job required to be done is at lower lumbar spine. Upper so because it has been seen and it has been compressed. No, there is there is cord edema there. There is cord edema here. You can see the cord edema here. Yes. So the and, decompression and, uh, part Dr. is Ketan, Now, if you see the whole long uh, that uh, screen view, mm. so it, there is not much of a change in the balance. The dorsal spine is not that much kyphotic. Yeah, yeah. So overall, the alignment is quite yes. acceptable. Okay. So now we'll go to the uh, main problem that occurred post-operatively. There was localized pain in the left thigh anteriorly. It was quite localized. It was not radicular, as if coming from the back down. It was a constant pain with intermittent shooting, which she complained immediately post-op. Uh, when I start, tried to look, uh, because the pain was bang anterior, I thought it could be something with the hip which has been missed or something. And I, with the hip movements, there was increase in the pain. The quadriceps power, which was originally 5, was also not much reduced. It was 4 plus. And uh, I thought it may be weak due to her pain. You know, it might be apparent weakness, not a true weakness. And there was no tingling numbness. So, uh, Satyan, what would be the likely causes of these uh, symptoms? Yeah, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit strange. Uh, if you put in uh, your implants are at L45, uh, so and getting an anterior pain does not match the roots. It doesn't look like it is uh, related to handling you. Uh, Which I, level? At uh, a higher level, if you're talking okay. about L2 okay. or L3, uh, okay. okay. doesn't look like you've done much. Uh, so I may actually be thinking maybe uh, you've missed something. Uh, is does she have a, a hip pathology uh, together with that? Hip. Maybe during positioning you've had some pressure on the hip, got extension of that of the hip joint and caused some problem there. These are the things that I'm so just one thinking of. Possibility is uh, hip. In my mind. Look like that only. Yes. Uh, Dr. Zaveri, please tell us what would you do with this very lost, severe pain and uh, but it was localized and intermittently increasing. No tingling, numbness, no, no weakness. No tingling, numbness. Weakness was, the quadriceps appear to be slightly weakened but uh, because of the pain it could be a you know, uh, poor response from the patient. The first thoughts in my mind would be what could be the cause. And as Satyan said, you start from the beginning and your first cause would be positioning. Sometimes the bolster which you keep can abut on the anterior thigh and you can get cause compression of the femoral nerve and which can result in pain or weakness in the anterior thigh. Or just direct impingement of the bolster on the thigh could also cause pain. The second thing which could be there is that maybe there is some 
sometimes what happens is when we decompress, patient had probably symptoms on one side and you decompress obviously stenosis both sides, then suddenly the inflammation of the root on that side, they start complaining of pain on the opposite side which they didn't have earlier and they are very unhappy about it but it's going to settle down. So that's the second possibility that is there from the handling of the nerves. The third possibility is of course a hematoma which could also be still be there. The fourth is there could be some implant impingement but again as Satyan said there is a mismatch between the level of where you have done the implanting and the level where the pain is. Right. So these are some of the issues there are there. Now the question was if it was, it was in the first day itself then I would still wait and watch maybe give a little bit of steroids, anti-inflammatory, wait and watch because I wouldn't be no hurry, I am expecting the patient to get a little bit of pain. On second and third day and if on mobilization patient has increasing pain, then obviously I am a little worried and I would like to investigate. In this case you have to investigate with everything, you have to do an x-ray, you have to do a CT scan and you have to do an MRI, each one has a different role over here. The MRI will show you the exact source of compression, the neural elements, etc. The CT scan will show you where the implants are, is there any malposition, is the back out of the cage or the screw are uh, misplaced, that's what it will show you. So, and X-ray is going to be what your follow-up is going to be. Yeah. So you need a baseline. So, I'll, so get I'll, all these investigations. I'll go ahead and uh, show that. This is the post-operative X-ray. Nikhil, anything? Doesn't seem to be very, uh, the screws are well placed medially, but I would like to check the position of the screws on the CT scan, that's it. I, I would not consider anything else. The so, cage is in the well yeah. placed. So basically as uh, Gautam was saying, you know, hip injury during positioning, some some, some existing hip, hip pathology which was missed, or I thought, I thought even a stress fracture of the femur which had just come into play. And uh, I did the CT scan of the hip and the spine as well. So, I found that the screw was uh, misplaced. Maybe the left side screw appears a little bit more medial, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see here, it is uh, going from here and as you can see here, the trajectory is more medial. So, as we all know, screws, pedicle screws in the lumbar spine have very little room for error medially and inferiorly. If you are breaking out of the pedicle superiorly or laterally, there is not much worry. But if you are breaking through medially or inferiorly, then the chances of nerve impingement are very high. Sometimes what happens is just that you put the screw still may not be outside the pedicle. Only when you are putting the screw, the thread, the cortex of the gets cut through. Yeah, and yeah. the screw has good purchase. But you know, because the nerve root is so close, it keeps on irritating the nerves, there is inflammation and that causes the pain. So, you, if you see this carefully now, you can appreciate that this screw is quite medially angled and that was the cause of the deficit. So, shall we discuss further this? I think we can go ahead with the lecture because we are running short of okay, time. Okay, fine. But I think this year… So, just I will just highlight a few important things in this. Uh, what about the, uh, uh, what, what precautions do you take when you change these screws, Satyan? Uh, so, we'll have to maybe do an uh, in-out in technique type, we have to go more lateral. Over here, you've also put in a little bit superior, so I'm sure there'll be more space on the other side. Maybe you'll have to put in a smaller screw also, in terms of width, because you don't have too much of uh, bone left, so maybe a 5 mm screw. But it can be uh, reasonably well. You expect well dural tears? Uh, dural tears also an issue because you already got uh, an impingement. So you have, when you're taking it out, you have to uh, protect the nerve root while you're uh, extracting the root. But it's still a little a weird presentation because uh, the L4 nerve root yeah. should not cause this it kind of It was not a very clear, uh, clear cut, but that's, uh, that's the... Yes. Thank you. So, you saw two cases of post-operative neurologic deficits and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. This is patient one, a 47-year-old lady. She had progressive spastic paraparesis. She had grade 3 power in both the lower limbs. She underwent a transthoracic decompression for the OPLL, which you see, and she got up with complete paraplegia.
If you see the MRI on the, which is done post-operatively over here, you can see that the decompression has been perfectly done. There is no more compression left and there is no significant compression. Is this a hematoma or is it just the empty spot? What is it? And what should I do next? That is the question. A 57-year-old lady, back pain, left leg pain, typical symptoms of spinal canal stenosis, had a left instrumented T-lift with bilateral lateral recess decompression. In the evening, her left leg pain had disappeared. She had mild discomfort in the right leg. Patient mobilized comfortably. But over the next two days, she got progressively mobilized. And as she got, got mobilized, she started complaining of increasing right leg pain and paresthesia. X-ray was done and X-ray showed that this screw was a little inferior compared to this screw. Does it really matter? And so we got a CT scan done and CT scan showed that this screw was going through the foramen and impinging the nerve. What next? A 77-year-old lady, she underwent a Whipple's surgery under general anesthesia. Epidural catheter was inserted. She was started on Clexane 0.4 international units subcutaneously post-operatively. 24 hours after the surgery, she complained to the surgeon that she had paresthesia in the left lower limb. It was thought that this was because of the epidural anesthesia that was being given. 72 hours post-op, she complained of weakness in the left lower limb, unable to move. Again, it was attributed to the epidural anesthesia. But at that time, and 96 hours later, she developed a weakness in the right lower limb. The epidural catheter was removed and MRI was done. The MRI showed a large epidural hematoma secondary to that epidural catheter. What next is the question? And that's what I'm going to answer for you. What should you do when you get a post-operative neurologic deficit? This is a dreaded complication and it is far more common than everybody comes out with. The incidence in literature is, varies between 0 to 10 percent and this variability in literature is primarily because different types of cohorts of patients with different types of pathologies are reported. The definition of a post-operative neurologic is different for different people and the follow-up also of patients is different and therefore there is a difference in the variability of incidence. With spinal stenosis decompression, Global Spine Journal reported an uh, incidence of 2.8%. With lumbar discectomies, a post-op neurologic deficit of 0.21%. With scoliosis correction, about 2%. And complex adult spinal deformities, almost 22%. When you look at classifying these neurologic deficits, there are five types. The first of which is new onset pain, basically radiculitis or sensory loss. The second grade is a unilateral motor weakness. Grade 3 is a bilateral motor weakness. Grade 4 is a corda equina syndrome. And grade 5 is a complete paraplegia. What has been the common etiologies in most of the studies that have been done? The first and foremost is an epidural or a subdural hematoma. Misplaced instrumentation, direct surgical trauma to neural elements during the decompression or secondary to the correction of deformity, incomplete decompression of neural elements, that means persistent compression of the nerves secondary to a retained disc and incomplete stenosis decompression, positioning as Satyan mentioned and sometimes you don't know what is the cause, you've done a good job, it might just be called edema. What is the management? I think the management starts preoperatively with meticulous documentation of the symptoms and the neurology. An appropriate counseling and consent is vital. The complication should not come as a surprise to you or your patient. If that happens, the patient loses faith in you and develops distrust in your abilities and care. So do not overpromise patients. The next thing is detection. Immediately post-operatively, you must do a neurological examination after the patient is conscious and alert. And the findings must be detected meticulously and documented. As Satyan mentioned in his case, the de deficit started only about 4 to 5 hours after surgery. And it was good that his RMO was so vigilant that he noticed the symptoms and signs 
early in the course of the disease so that appropriate action can be taken. Neurological examination must be repeated and documented on several occasions over the first 24 hours and during the stay in the hospital. Once a deficit has occurred, your patient wakes up in the recovery, you see the patient has a deficit. The first step thing you do is you review the surgery with your surgical team, the anesthetist, find out when you are doing a cervical stenosis decompression, was there any drop in blood pressure at any time, was there a drop in oxygenation, what happened, why has this, were there any step you personally feel could have led to this deficit. Then the second step as I said was maintenance of blood pressure and oxygenation is vital. Check if your drains are working adequately. In the dorsal spine and lumbar spine, if you are suspecting a large hematoma, turn the patient immediately to the side. Sometimes, because of the closed cap compartment, there is back pressure. If you turn the patient to the side, the pressure immediately reduces, patients may feel better. And at this is the time to consider IV methylprednisolone. The next step is how to deal with your patient and the relatives at that time. That is also vital. First, you need to calm yourself, take a deep breath, think out what you are going to tell the patient and relatives. And you must discuss this with your entire team because entire team must be on the same page when talking to the relatives. Sit with the relatives, explain the problem, the cause, the steps to be taken and the prognosis of this condition. Avoid retaliating to patients or families angry outbursts at this situation. Obviously, they are worried. Obviously, they don't know what is going to happen to them and therefore, they are going to be upset. Then you go on to what is the possible diagnosis. If it is an immediate postoperative de deficit, think of direct trauma to the neural structures. Think of a misplacement of your spinal instrumentation. Think of problems during correction of spinal deformity. You have overcorrected and that has caused it. Or an inadequate decompression or positioning. If it is a delayed neurologic deficit, think of an epidural hematoma which has gradually expanded, an inadequate decompression, a correction of a deformity can also result, especially kyphotic deformity. What happens is when you correct a kyphotic deformity, gradually the blood supply may go down over time and patient can develop a neurologic deficit. In such patients, neuromonitoring is recommended to be continued for the 24 hours after the surgery. Displacement of screws, wires, cages and bone grafts. And late onset deficits is because of epidural scarring, arachnoiditis, infection and instability. Get appropriate investigations at this stage. Do not think, keep on thinking about money. This is the time when you need to get, be aggressive and try to find the cause. So here you can see that there is a spinal cord edema which is because of direct injury to the cord during the surgery an epidural hematoma, a misplaced, subtly misplaced screw over here. This was a person who underwent a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. The lamina is impinging on the dural sac and this is a, mis a cage which has backed out and resulted. And all of these can be picked up fairly alright with CT and MRI. And finally you come to the treatment. You must remember do not procrastinate. If you are worried about your decision, get a second opinion from a senior colleague. But reversible causes must be dealt forthwith. If you know that there is a hematoma, if you know there is a misplaced screw, operate early. Early resurgery offers the best chance of neurological recovery. In the absence of a reversible cause or an unknown cause, just exploration because you want to do something for the patient is not advisable. So in this patient, where an adequate decompression has been done and there is nothing else you can do by re-exploring this person, please keep your hands off the patient. Start steroids, do the oxygenation, blood pressure bit and be patient and pray. In this patient where there was a misplaced pedicle screw, Go in early, revise the pedicle screw in the appropriate fashion, patient gets complete relief of symptoms. And in this patient, where there was an epidural hematoma, even though the patient was 7 days post the epidural hematoma, I went in immediately, 
and operated, evacuated the hematoma. The hematoma already organized into a thick clot. I had to separate it gradually, wash it out. But she started recovering the very next day. So the outcomes of post-operative neurologic deficit have been very clearly seen that if there is a definite cause, then appropriate surgical treatment is useful when it is done early in the disease process. So take home messages, new post-operative deficits following thoracic or lumbar spine surgery are far more common than are reported in literature. Most deficits are subtle, hence careful neurological examination is vital. Always listen to the patient's complaints. Don't think this patient is a cribber and avoid listening to the patient. Early surgery in patients with clearly identifiable and reversible causes offers the best chance of neurological recovery. I would like to end with this slide, which is very vital for all of us surgeons. We don't want to believe. We don't want to hear. We don't want to talk and accept that complications occur at our hands. The earlier you realize the disasters you can do, the earlier you will make your patient better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gautam sir. This was a very good session today. Uh, the, the session is open for question and answers if you, anybody has it. Uh, good afternoon, uh, faculty. I am Dr. Dhanishekar Raja. I am an orthoplastic consultant from Ganga Hospital. So we reported a case of uh, epidural hematoma causing paraplegia and uh, probably 24 hours later the epidural topper we diagnosed that patient had an epidural hematoma, not the effect of epidural analgesia. Then we sent the patient for MRI and uh, once the patient come back for MRI we posted the patient for surgery. Then the recovery started, she was totally para paraplegic. In the preoperative holding room she started moving. So we treated conservatively, she completely recovered. So what's your comment on that? Can you, will you still go ahead and operate or you can try a conservative trial? The patient is already showing signs of improvement with your steroids and with the fact, with the time that has been spent. Then you can afford to wait and watch and see whether the progressive recovery is happening. What has been found is that with conservative treatment also they recover, but the quality of recovery and the completeness of recovery is poor. So, what happens is there is a difference between anecdotal reporting and uh, a series of cases. So, in your case, it's one case. We need to see whether 100 cases treated conservatively such improve and to what extent they improve. But so, the patient, patient itself was a high risk patient for uh, taking it back post uh, oncology patient recovering. So, we thought. So, you have to consider all these individual patients, patients also, yeah. individual yeah. things. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Mukhi, sir. There was a case of a large sequestrated disc at L2, L3 on the right side and we did a fenestration and removed out that piece and believe me there was no distraction, uh, hitting on any of the nerves. Post-operatively total paraplegia. What did you, did you must have investigated with MRI, yes. what did you find? Nothing came on the MRI. Dr. Srivastav, with your wide experience on this subject, could you like to offer some advice or some solutions or insight? You told L2, L3 this. L2, L3, <laughs> so there is fenestration, a not interlaminar, and removed out that sequestrated piece, and uh, post-operatively both the legs, ah, not so so, I feel there might be two possibilities. Now, higher disc, you know, and uh, if you see, when you wish to take out the last disc you told, one might retract the sac significantly. That is the one reason. And as you told fenestration, rather interlaminar is better that you have created the space, some breathing space for the neural sac. So, fenestration in a large disc at higher level all the all the possibility of deficits are there. Satin, you also wanted to make a point? Yes, at, uh, at L23 level, it is uh, actually not uh, advised to do any fenestration surgery. 
at L23 already the canal is uh, the space no. is much lesser. You know, you, it's be always better to do a proper laminectomy and do the discectomy. It gives much more breathing space. Sometimes there is an element of constitutional stenosis, which is missed out by the radiologist and the surgeons. And when you do these higher level days and you don't decompress the other levels which might be stenotic, you could land up in a total deficit. Luckily, patient recovered. Yeah, patient recovered. Lovely. We started giving methylprednisolone. She recovered on the unaffected side and touch wood. She is walking today. MRI yeah. showed nothing. I have an MRI machine on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Immediately I took her MRI. Immediate. So Lovely. not showing anything. And this is what Sri Vastavji has said. Exactly I felt that. Okay, the cord or the corda equina was a little bit retracted more and sudden decompression was the thing. So yeah, sir, as very, very good point you are making. And uh, I think uh, what is important for us to realize is that the magic pill is methyl prednis alone. Huh? <laughs> Vikas, please go ahead. I just want to make a comment about uh, Satyan's uh, this thing, that laminectomy has to be done. Uh, we have been doing cubular discectomy for years for almost all cases, high level disc as well as corda equina syndromes, central disc. Uh, we didn't find any problem using a tube. Adequate decompression is key and main thing, main point is when you go to the center, towards the center, drill the base of finest process like you do over the top decompression and then do the uh, discectomy because you create adequate space. Probably, uh, I don't know about uh, Dr. Mukhi's case, but probably only fenestration, probably he has not done the uh, base of finest process decompression. Good point. Thank you for the there, comments. Uh, uh, yes. I think we need to close the session. Yes, we need, sir. We need to close the session. Sorry. Thank you for the And thank you very thank much you to all the panelists for a lovely, lovely discussion. I hand the bike to the chairperson.